Uh, praise the Lord and uh, welcome once again to the Tabernacle series. And uh, today we are uh, in uh, number 14. We are in number 14 and we are looking at the battle of the Armageddon. And so I want to welcome us to this uh, presentation in the tabernacle series and i'm praising the lord for the things that we have covered so far i believe we are laying a foundation that will be able to help us study more into the issues of the sanctuary the sanctuary both in heaven and the sanctuary on earth and that is why the series is called the tabernacles the one in heaven and the one on earth and so i like to pray because we have a ground to cover and uh, we enter into the session dear lord in heaven Thank you so much for the Sabbath blessing that has just passed. And Lord, we want those blessings to surround us even as we go through the new week. We pray that uh, you may give us the spirit of your son, that we may be able to understand thy will upon our lives and uh, walk in it. And so may you work through these feeble instruments and feeble people that uh, your message may be able to go forth in the world to revive the ones which are about to die. Thank you for accepting us and our prayers in Jesus' name. Amen. And uh, if uh, there has been uh, a battle that has been uh, waited upon, it is the battle of the Magedo, when uh, the forces of evil meet with the forces of light, when the forces of darkness at last have that final clash with the forces uh, of uh, the, the forces of darkness have that final clash with the uh, forces uh, of darkness of evil. And so this is something to, I, I like just to bring about the information that uh, I have found, and then uh, it will be opening um, a ground for us, or it will be laying a foundation for us to dig deep into the issue of the battle of uh, Armageddon. Now, we know that um, the battle we are engaged in is the great controversy between uh, Christ and his angels and Satan and his angels. And in this battle, the warfare is not of the might. The warfare is not of uh, the strong, neither the swift or the quick. The warfare is about uh, those who are filled with the spirit of God. And that is why the weapons that uh, we are going to use to fight in this war are not carnal, uh, uh, carnal uh, weapons, but uh, they are spiritual weapons to demolish the stronghold of the principalities in heavenly places, the prince of the air and the prince of darkness. And so um, I'd I like just to share with us some um, few thoughts uh, on this, um, as I said, as uh, we lay uh, a background for all this stuff. Um, we are told that uh, from Egypt to the boots, as the decree issued by the various rulers of the Christ and Dome against commandment keepers shall withdraw the protection of the government and abandon them to those who desire their destruction. The people of God will flee from the cities and villages and associate together in companies dwelling in the most desolate and uh, solitary places. Many will find refuge in the strongholds of the mountains, like the Christians of the Piedmont Valleys. They will make the high places of the earth their sanctuary and will thank God for the munitions of the rocks. You can check that in Isaiah chapter 33, verse 16. And so, when uh, we study the, bet, the battle of the Armageddon, we ask ourselves, how is the battle of the Armageddon related to the sanctuary message? And, uh, you know, this battle comes after the three angels' messages have been preached and everyone has to make a decision. So it is a decision either to be on the side of God or on the side of Satan himself. And we shall see some type anti type story of the Battle of Armageddon because it is not something that started here on earth. The battle has been raging 
since uh, 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 there was the times of heaven and the times of the earth, Satan himself starting the rebellion on, in heaven. And in Isaiah chapter 14, you find him saying that uh, I'll uh, uh, ascend high to the mountain of God in the sides of the north and I'll sit like the uh, I'll sit like the Most High and rule over the stars of uh, heaven. And so it is a, a war that has been going on, but there is a final showdown that will be able to happen. So uh, there is nothing new under the sun. What has been is what shall be, and the Lord required of the history of the past. And so we are in this war that started in heaven, and it is climaxing in Revelation chapter sixteen when the seven last plagues starts to fall. And so it is not strange to find a type anti type story of the battle of uh, Armageddon or uh, um, a story in the Bible which uh, gives us an eavesdrop in the actual war of, uh, uh, or the battle of uh, the Armageddon. And, uh, in Revelation 12, 17, we are told that and the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So I was saying, how does the battle of Armageddon relate to the sanctuary? It is about a war, uh, about two forces, and the forces of light and the forces of evil, and the decisions that are made in the sanctuary, who are the followers of God, and who are not the followers of God. And so this decision that is made in the sanctuary culminates in the final showdown of uh, uh, one party wanting to reign over another party and one party protecting the other party from the reign of the other. And so we are told in uh, Revelation 16, 13 to 15, to 16, and I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of uh, the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of Almighty. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest the he walked naked and they see his shame. And he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. And so what is all this battle against uh, or about? In Psalms 119, 126, we are told, it is time for thee, Lord, to work, for they have made void thy law. You, you see, we have uh, a system upon the earth that is started in heaven that says, we will have nothing to do with the law of God. We will have nothing to do with the government of God. It is an arbitrary government and the angels do not need, angels do not need to be governed by laws because they are holy. This is the warfare that uh, uh, Lucifer started and he, become, he became Satan. Not being satisfied with uh, what God was offering for his government, he thought that he could establish another rival kingdom against the father and his place was not found in heaven. He came here on earth and uh, he became limited on this earth and he thinks he will be able to take over the new city, Jerusalem, when it is coming down. This is the showdown that we are talking about, the battle of Armageddon, the rebellion that started in heaven and what was all uh, what was it all about? It was about a God who is just and fair, who was misrepresented by Satan or Lucifer and became Satan. And now he came on this earth to distort the image of God upon his creation. And the Lord is serious on this battle because he said that there shall be a final showdown and people will have to choose on which side they are going to be when that battle shall be fought. And so we are in the time when God is in the business of restoring his image in his people so that they may decide which kingdom they will be subjects of when this war is finally fought or when the climax of this war comes. And uh, we have um, the government of the evil one 
who says that uh, he wants to give liberty, but in sin. Now, I want you to understand that way. The government of God is made on the principles of love, a selfless love, agape love, a government that he desires his subjects to live free and not in bondage and in slavery of sin. But here there is another entity who wants to establish a government and a kingdom, whereas he is establishing to, in it, it on the principle that uh, do as thy will. It doesn't matter how you live. It doesn't matter the kind of lifestyles you have. All it is well and you can be part of my kingdom. And so there is a showdown going on and we are really uh, making decisions which will array us either on the side of the evil one or either on the side of God. And uh, so uh, it is a time for the Lord to work for they have made void thy law. In Isaiah chapter 8, verses 9 to 13, we are told, associate yourself, O ye people, and ye shall be broken in pieces and give ear only of far countries. Guard yourselves and ye shall be broken in pieces. Guard yourself and you shall be broken in pieces. Take counsel together and it shall come to naught. Speak the word and it shall not stand, for God is with us. For the Lord spake thus to me with a strong hand and instructed me that I should not walk in the way of these people, saying, Say ye not a confederacy. And we know that the battle of Armageddon is a battle of confederacies coming together against the kingdom of God. Say ye not a confederacy to all them to whom these people shall say, a confederacy, neither fear ye their fear, neither be afraid. Sanctify the Lord of hosts himself and let him be your fear and let him be your dread. And so as uh, different world leaders, different scholars and different laymen, different pastors are today making a confederacy either with God or with uh, the arch enemy, uh, we are told that uh, the one who will have union with God shall fear nothing. The one who has his fear in God should not fear of the confederacy of the evil ones. You find that uh, Asaph in uh, Psalm 73, he was envying the evil when he saw their prosperity, when he saw their plans, when he saw that they did not cry for anything until. He went into the sanctuary, then realized the end of this battle. And so even for us to be able to understand the battle of Armageddon so well, go into the sanctuary of the Lord where Satan was actually um, fighting to be part of the kingship in heaven, and he wanted to overturn the tables in heaven, his place was not found there. And we find that on the day of atonement, those who did not appear before the Lord and partake of his spirit, they were cut off from Israel. And so don't be, don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. This battle is not going to be a battle where anyone can stand on the neutral road. There is no neutral road in this uh, uh, battle. Everyone has to decide their destiny. Everyone has to decide their destiny. In Isaiah 24, verses 5 to verses 6, the earth also is defiled under the inhabitants thereof because they have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinance, broken the everlasting covenant. Therefore hath the curse devoured the earth, and they that dwell therein are desolate. Therefore the inhabitants of the earth are burned, and few men left. Ezekiel chapter 38, verses 21. And I will call for a sword against him, Throughout all my mountains, said the Lord God, every man's sword shall be against his brother. We are talking about a battle that will spare, spare not either, will not spare either the young or the old. In Haggai chapter 2, verses 22, and I told you that we are just laying a ground so that you may go and study more on the battle of Armageddon, how the battles that have been in the past really gives a glimpse into the final battle. And I'll overthrow the throne of kingdoms and I'll destroy the strength of the kingdoms of the heathen. 
and I'll overthrow the chariots and those that ride in them and the horses and their riders shall come down, everyone by the sword of his brother. And so those uh, who reject the masses of the Lord. Now, our God is a good God because he has given us all these years to decide that which is good for us. I thank God because his government is not a government of force. We are told force is the last resort of every false religion. And uh, I, some, I, I somehow cover this in the, in the marriage setup where this brings about a good illustration. If you find uh, a, a family where the wife is loading over the husband or the husband is loading over the wife, that family will never stand and that family cannot have joy. But when you have a family where people can come on the table and be able to converse and be able to reason out as mature people, as even God is inviting us to reason with him in Isaiah chapter 1, verses 18, you will find that that marriage will be more enjoyable where people have their free will and they choose to submit to each other rather than to be forced to submit to each other. That is why God has given us all this time. Just as in marriage, you are given time to be able to go relationship, courtship, engagement, and at last marriage. So in this uh, plan of redemption, we have gi been given all this period so that we may decide out of love and not out of force. But then you will find that uh, the battle that we are engaged in, on the other side, people are forced to be part of that kingdom. And you want to not to find yourself in the kingdom where force is the rule of that uh, kingdom. Continued on, we find in uh, Isaiah chapter 19, verses 1 to 2, the burden of Egypt, behold, the Lord rideth upon a swift cloud and shall come into Egypt. And the idols of Egypt shall be moved at his presence, and the heart of Egypt shall be shall melt in the midst of it. And I'll set the Egyptians against the Egyptians, and they shall fight everyone against his brother, and everyone against his neighbor, city against city, and kingdom against kingdom. In Isaiah 19, verses 3 to 4. And the spirit of Egypt shall fail in the midst thereof, and I'll destroy the council thereof, and they shall seek the idols, to the idols, and to the charmers, and to them that uh, have familiar spirit, and to the wizards. And the Egyptians will I give over into the hand of cruel lord, and a fierce king shall rule over them, saith the lord, the lord of hosts. And uh, why try to use this analogy of Egypt? Because we find that uh, Egypt symbolizes rebellion and Egypt symbolizes the world. And so Egypt is a fitful representation of all the confederacies that come together against the Lord of hosts. That is why I'm using the symbol of uh, Egypt and uh, we can learn together about uh, the symbol of Egypt. In Testimonies, volume three, 267, paragraph one, who are standing in the council of God at this time? Is it those who virtually excuse wrongs among the professed people of God and who murmur in their hearts, if not openly, against those who will reprove sin? Is it those who take their stand against them and sympathize with those who commit wrong? No, indeed. And so those who are excusing evil and standing in the councils against God, they are not working for God, and so they cannot be on the side of God when the battle is fought. Meaning that uh, the Lord has given us the sanctuary to be able to know his councils so that uh, we may make an informed decision on which side we will be on this side of uh, the question. And uh, continued on in 3267.1. Unless they repent and leave the work of Satan in oppressing those who have the burden of the work and in holding up the hands of sinners in Zion, they will never receive the mark 
of God's sealing approval, they will fall into the general destruction of the wicked represented by the work of the five men bearing slaughter weapons. The work of judgment begins at the sanctuary. The command is slay utterly old and young, both maids and little children and women, but come not near any man upon whom is the mark and begin at my sanctuary. Then they began at the ancient men which were before the house, said the God, I'll recompense their way upon their head. The words will soon be spoken. Go your way and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth, TM 431. As the angels of God cease to hold in check the fierce winds of human passion, all the elements of strife will be let loose. The whole world will be involved in ruin more terrible than that which came upon Jerusalem of all. The Great Controversy, 1888 edition, 614 paragraph one. Now, as we talk about this battle of uh, Armageddon, I want us to look into some of the story or some, uh, some story which uh, gives us an eavesdrop into the future battle of uh, Armageddon, into the future battle of uh, Armageddon. And uh, in Genesis chapter four, we find uh, a scenario which uh, we are told actually reveals what this war is all about. And so, the in every offering to God, and this is 1 BC 1086.6. In offering to God, we are to acknowledge the one great gift that alone can make our service acceptable to Him. When Abel offered the firstling of the flock, he acknowledged God not only as the giver of his temporal blessing, but also as the giver of the Savior. Abel's gift was the very choicest he could bring, for it was the Lord's specified claim. But Cain brought only of the fruit of the ground, and his offering was not accepted by the Lord. It did not express faith in Christ. All our offerings must be sprinkled with the blood of the atonement. As the purchased possession of the Son of God, we are to give the Lord our individual lives. So in the offering of Abel is revealed the giving of our lives to Christ. In the offering of Cain, it is revealed the rebellion against Christ and not recognizing him as the atoning sacrifice. And so finally, there was a clash between Abel and Cain. Why? Because one wanted to do the will of God and other wanted to approach things the way it seemed best to him. And this brought about an enmity between the two. This is the kind of the final showdown we will have. Those who accept the will of God and those who wants to do things on their own, and then those who don't want to do the things the way the Lord would want them will have a problem with those who are the true seekers of Jehovah. A uh, fallen man, because of his guilt, could no longer come directly before God with his supplication for his transgression of the divine law had placed an impassable barrier between the holy God and the transgressor. But a plan was devised that the sentence of death should rest upon a substitute. In the plan of redemption, there must be shedding of blood for death must come in consequence of man's sin. The beasts of, for sacrificial offering were to prefigure Christ. In the slain victim, man was to see the fulfillment for the time being uh, of God's word, he shall surely die. That is uh, 1 BC 10.86.7. And so in these things that we are reading, we find that a company was developed where there was persecution of each other or, or the other. The Lord saw the wrath of Cain. He saw the falling of his countenance. Thus is revealed how closely the Lord marks every action, all the intents and purposes. Yes, even the expression of the countenance. This, though man may say nothing, express his refusal to do the way and the will of God. Well, might the question be asked you of the Lord when you cannot follow the impulse of your own rebellious heart and are restrained from doing your own unrighteous and sanctified will? Why art thou wrath? And why is thy countenance fallen? Such exhibitions reveal that because they cannot do after certain arts and devices, they are provoked and can only manifest a spirit similar to that of kind. There could be harmony, there could be no harmony between the two brothers. 
and contention must come. Abel could not concede to Cain without being guilty of disobedience to the special command, commands of God. And so we are seeing this war between Abel and Cain, the one, the child of light, and the other, the child of darkness. And one, we are told he is being controlled with the spirit of Satan, and the other is being controlled by the spirit of God. And we have only two spirits in the world, the spirit of God and the spirit of Satan. And the final showdown will be between the spirit of God and the spirit of Satan. And so in 7 BC 982.4, we are told, battle of Armageddon soon to be fought. There are only two parties in, the world, in our world, those who are loyal to God and those who stand under the banner of the prince of darkness, represented by Abel and Cain. Satan and his angels will come down with power and signs and lying wonders to deceive those who dwell on the earth and, if possible, the very left. The crisis is right upon us. Is this to paralyze the energies of those who have a knowledge of the truth? Is the influence of the powers of the deception so far reaching that the influence of the truth will be overpowered? So the final showdown which we are being told is the battle of Armageddon is between the banner of the prince of darkness and those who are loyal to God. It is between the law of God and the, um, the, the traditions of uh, men. The traditions of men. In 7 BC 982.8, two opposing powers, two great opposing powers are revealed in the last great battle. On one side stands the creator of heaven and earth, all on his side bear his signet. So, so for us to be on the Lord's side, we have to bear his signet. How do we bear his signet? By the cleansing happening in the most holy place. So the battle of Armageddon is brought about with the work of, in, uh, the work of vindicating those who are on the side of the Lord and those who are on the side of the evil. They are obedient to his commandments or commands. On the other side stand the prince of darkness with, with those who have chosen apostasy and rebellion. Revealed Herald 7, uh, May 7, 1901, 7 BC 982.8. And so as you are seeing, as we read these things, the battle of Armageddon is about those who accept Christ as their atoning sacrifice and those who rebel against Christ are, are not bringing in their life to conform to the pattern of Jesus Christ. And so Satan is the parent of unbelief, murmuring, and rebellion. He filled kind with doubt and with madness against his innocent brother and against God because his sacrifice was refused and Abel's accepted, and he slew his brother in his insane madness. So uh, we find that at the end of the day, those whose sacrifice have not been accepted will be against those whose sacrifice has been accepted. But why are others, their sacrifices not accepted? Because in their sacrifice, they could not recognize Christ as our mediator, our savior, our atoning sacrifice, and our redeemer. They never came to a point they appreciated his shed blood. And so they are on the side of rebellion. And why? Who are they fighting against? They are fighting against those who have recognized Christ as their atoning sacrifice, their savior, their strength, their power, and their redemption. This is the war that we are talking about, and it is being fought, and there shall be a final showdown. Which side, my brother and my sister, will you be on? Satan is mastering his forces for the last battle. The present is a solemn, a solemn, fearful time for the church. 7 BC 983 uh, um, are commanding on the battle of Armageddon. We are told the angels are already guarded, while waiting the mandate of God to pour their violence of wrath, of wrath upon the world. The strong angels are taking up the work of vengeance, for the spirit of God is gradually withdrawing from the world. Satan is also must mastering his forces of evil, going forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them under the banner to be trained for the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Satan is to make most powerful efforts for the mastery in the last great conflict. 
fundamental principles will be brought out and decisions made in regard to them. Do you understand what the Battle of Armageddon is all about? It is about making decision upon fundamental principles, either the principles of heaven or the principles of darkness. And how do we come to conform to the principles of heaven? By entering into the sanctuary and being cleansed so that our mind may be the mind of Jesus Christ. Now, skepticism is prevailing everywhere and godliness abounds. The faith of individual members of the church will be tested as though there were not another person in the world. And this is the preparation for the battle of Armageddon, the final battle. It involves each one being tested by God under investigative judgment. From there, then the two armies will be developed. It is from the decision we make in the day of atonement in the sanctuary that will develop the two camps and their soldiers so that they may be able to be involved in this war. The armies of God, God take the field. We need to study the pouring out of the seventh vial. The powers of evil will not yield up the conflict without a struggle, but providence has a part to act in the battle of Armageddon. When the earth is lightened with the glory of the age of Revelation 18, the religious elements, good and evil, will awake from slumber and the armies of the living God will take the field. It is interesting that uh, she comments going forth and back on this battle that uh, uh, the decisions are going on during uh, the cleansing of the sanctuary and the decision are going on that prepares the people for the final showdown during the proclamation of uh, the message in Revelation chapter 18. If you read very well, it, she quotes, when quoting Revelation 14, Revelation 16 verse 14 to 17, she quotes Revelation chapter 18 verses 1 that uh, when the earth is lightened with the glory of the angel of Revelation 18, the, re the religious elements, good and evil, will awake from slumber and the armies of the living God will take to the field. But providence has a part to act in the battle of Armageddon. So this battle is not about human beings fighting human beings. It is a battle of the prince of darkness against the prince of light. It is a battle that, first of all, the minds must come to a conclusion that this is the army we are going to belong on to. And so we are told a type of anti-type story of Cain continues and Abel in 1 BC 10, 87.2, because she says that as we read Revelation 16, let us read uh, Genesis chapter 4 and see the similarities of what was there and what will be. God has given to every man his work, and if anyone turns from the work that God has given him to do the work of Satan, to defile his own body or lead another into sin, that man's work is cast, and the brand of Cain is placed upon him. What is the brand of Cain? The brand of Cain is rebellion. And the battle of Armageddon is about rebellion. The ruin of his victim will cry unto God as did the blood of Abel. That is 1 BC 1087.2. Uh, any man, be he a minister or layman who seeks to compel or control the reason of any other man, becomes an agent of Satan to do his work. And in the sight of the heavenly universe, he bears the mark of kind. And uh, force is the last resort of every false religion. So when the battle of Armageddon is fought and people are forced to be on the side of this or the side of that, we know that is a false religion. But God is not going to force anyone to worship him. Right now is the decision for everyone to decide either to be on his side or not to be on his side. Seth more noble in stature than Cain or Abel. Seth was of more noble stature than Cain or Abel and resembled Adam more than any of his other sons. The descendants of Seth had separated themselves from the wicked descendants of Cain. They cherished the knowledge of God's will, while the ungodly race of Cain had no respect for God and his sacred commandments. This is uh, 1 BC 10, 87.4. And so the lessons we get there is that uh, uh, Seth reached at a point he made decisions 
that resembled Adam more than any of his sons in the righteous image. And the descendants of Seth had separated themselves from the wicked descendants of Cain. And so in the battle of Armageddon, because we are reading Genesis chapter 4, there comes at a time when people have to make decisions to separate from evil. If they will stand in this great battle of Armageddon, then they must make a choice today and not when the battle is fought, the final battle is fought. And so today we are making a decision to be either like God or to be either like Satan. And when the final showdown appears, either you will be outside the city going to attack Jerusalem or you will be inside the city being protected, protected by God and Christ shall fight for you. The final slaughter in this battle, ministers and people see that they have not sustained the right relation to God. They see that they have rebelled against the author of all just and righteous law. The setting aside of the divine precepts gave rise to thousands of springs of evil, discord, hatred, iniquity, until the earth became one vast field of strife. That is the battle of Armageddon, one thing of corruption. This is the view that now appears to those who rejected truth and chose to cherish error. No language can express the longing which the disobedient and disloyal feel for that which they have lost forever, eternal life. Men whom the world has worshipped for their talents and eloquence now see things in their true light. They realize that what they have forfeited by transgression and they fall at the feet of those who whose fidelity they have despised and derided and confessed that God has loved them. Great Controversy, 1888 edition, page 665.3. And so the people see that they have been deluded. They accuse one another of having led them to destruction, but all unite in heaping their bitterest condemnation upon the ministers. Unfaithful pastors have prophesied smooth things. They have led their hearers to make void the law of God and to persecute those who will keep it holy. Now in their despair, these teachers confess before the world their work of deception. The multitude are filled with fury. We are lost, they cry, and you are the cause of our ruin. And they turn upon the false shepherds. The very ones that once admired them most will pronounce the most dreadful curses upon them. The very hands that once crowned them with laurels will be raised for their destruction. The swords which were to slay God's people are now employed to destroy their enemies. Everywhere there is strife and bloodshed. Let me say this. Are you a minister of the gospel? What are you teaching the people? Are you teaching them error so that they may not choose God and obedience to his will by the providence that Christ has given? by his spirit, or are you choosing to make them rebellious? Are you choosing them to make them obedience to God? Are you giving the people who listen to you meet in due season? Is your sacrifice really recognizing Jesus Christ as our atonement? Or is your someone teaching people to rely on their own works and be defeated to overcome sin and be on the side of the rebellious. You know, sometimes we have stood before the people and never taught them to rely on Christ for their salvation. We have always taught them to look at man and instead of looking at Christ. We are told in Testimonies to Ministers and Gospel Workers, page 91, that the people had lost the sight of Christ and now they needed to be pointed to his divine nature so that in him he may dispense with the rich gifts to give them his own righteousness instead of their sinfulness so that they may be obedient to the law of God. The righteousness which Christ gives unto us enables us to be able to obey him and be presented before the Father in a spotless way. If we teach people any other thing that they can rely on any other power to overcome sin, and in the end they get defeated 
and they start saying like Satan that uh, man cannot be obedient and keep the law of God. And then at the end, hate God because they see themselves not overcomers. We are told that uh, the people will turn against us in that great war. And so I'm so, uh, I'm so thinking of myself when I stand before the people as a layman. What do I tell them? Do I point them to the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world, or I'm pointing them to men? I'm pointing them to their own ones. I'm pointing them to offer a sacrifice like that of kind, whereas God says, bring ye a lamb in recognition that I am your a righteousness. Abel brings the, the fruits of the land without blood, meaning that he has nothing to do with Christ as the atonement. We may be having sermons, and there are sermons that prepares people to be like kind instead of being like Abel. Let us get back to the true message of righteousness by faith. And how can we get back to that message? By pointing the people into the sanctuary, what Christ has done to us in the courtyard and for us and through us, what he's doing in the holy place and what he's doing in the most holy place. If you continue beholding Jesus Christ, you will reproduce his image. You will be able to be accepted before the Father. But if you continue looking at self and trying to overcome self by self, I tell you, you will be defeated. At the end of the day, you will say victory over sin is impossible. And then that is what you will start preaching. You will start preaching to the people. We shall be sinning until Christ come. And because he is full of grace, he will take us because he is not willing to destroy anyone. And God does not destroy anyone. And so that is the message we shall start having. God is so loving that he will just take you to heaven the way you are. And why do we do that? Because we have not taught people how to rely on Christ and be able to overcome sin. In fact, in 1 John, the book of uh, the letter of John, uh, chapter 2, verse 6, 1 John 2, 6, it says, whoever says that he abides in him must walk as even he walked. So if anyone comes with the message that uh, we shall be sinning until Christ comes, know that he is bearing a false message. But this is what has been preached among us as a, as a people, and it's reproducing its fruits, which are the fruits of rebellion. So those who have taught the members falsehood and those who listen to them falsehood, they will be accountable to that. Think about that for a moment. In Great Controversy, page 656, paragraph one, as we bring this to a close, we have a few slides. I know it shall come even the ends of the earth, for the Lord hath a controversy with the nations. He will plead with all flesh. He will give them that are wicked to the sword. Jeremiah 25, 31. For 6,000 years, the great controversy has been in progress. The Son of God in, and his heavenly messengers have been in conflict with the power of the evil one. To warn, enlighten, and save the children of men. Now all have made their decision. The wicked have fully united with Satan in warfare against God. The time has come to go to vindicate the, vindicate the authority of his downtrodden law. Now, the controversy is not alone with Satan, but with men. The Lord has a controversy with the nations. He will give them that are wicked to the sword. The mark of deliverance has been set upon those that sigh and cry for the abomination that be done. Now the angel of death goes forth, represented in Ezekiel vision by the men, the men with the slaughtering weapons to whom the command is given, slay utterly old and young, both maids and little children and women, but come not near any man upon whom is the mark and begin at my sanctuary. Say the prophet, they begin at the ancient men, which were before house, the house, Ezekiel 9, 1 to 6. The work of destruction begins among those who have professed to be the spiritual guardians of the people. The false watchmen are the first to fall, there are none to pity or to spare. Men, women, maidens, and little children perish together. The Lord cometh out of his place to 
to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity, the earth also shall disclose her blood and shall no more cover her slain. And so uh, we find that in Isaiah 29 verse 26 verse 19, the dead men shall live together with my dead body shall they rise. Awake and sing ye that dwell in dust for thy deal as is as the deal of the herbs of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. Come, my people, enter thou into thy chambers and shut thy doors about thee, hide thyself as it were a little moment until the indignation be overpassed. For behold, the Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth also shall disclose her blood and shall no more cover the slain. And so the Lord is inviting us to choose today. He is giving us a humble time that we may develop the character, either the character of God or the character of the arch enemy. In Isaiah 34, verses 1 to 5, Come near ye nations to hear and hearken ye people. Let the earth hear and all that is there in the world and all things that come forth of it. For the indignation of the Lord is upon all nations and his fury upon all their armies. He hath utterly destroyed them. He hath delivered them to the slaughter. Their slain also shall be cast out and their sting shall come out of their carcasses. And the mountains shall be melted with their blood. And all the hosts of heaven shall be dissolved and the heavens shall be rolled together as a scroll. And all their hosts shall fall down as the leaf falleth off from the vine and as a falling fig from the fig tree. For my sword shall be bathed in heaven. Behold, it shall come down upon Idumea and upon the, uh, the people of my cast to judgment. And so uh, in this uh, final uh, battle, on one side, there will be arrayed people with the victor of Christ. And on the other side, will be arrayed a people, uh, uh, their heart and their spirit uh, start with the act deceiver uh, that is certain himself. In the last six slides, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, Revelation 21.1. And there was no more sea. And I, I, John, saw the holy city, new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her, her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. Now, you see, we are talking about the tabernacles. And he says that in the final, when the warfare has been ended, the tabernacle of God, the tabernacle of God shall be with his people. He shall uh, behold, uh, uh, he will dwell with them and uh, they shall be his people. Behold, the tabernacle of God is with them. So the decision is made in the tabernacle. If you will stay with him, then you should have made peace with him in the tabernacle. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. For the former things are passed away, and he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. What will God do to the children who obey him? The sinners in Zion are afraid. Fearful hath surprised, surprised the hypocrites. Who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? He that walketh righteously and speaketh uprightly, he that despiseth the gain of oppressions, that shaketh his hands from holding of bribes, that stoppeth his ears from hearing of blood, and shutteth his eyes from seeing evil. He shall dwell on high, his place of defense shall be the munitions of rock. Bread shall he shall be given him, his waters shall be sure. Thine eyes shall see the king in his beauty. They shall behold the land that is far off. And so as uh, the Lord was able to provide for the children of Israel in the wilderness, so he shall be able to provide for his children who cry and sigh for him every day. And we are promised that uh, 
the Lord shall be with us, the bread shall be given him, the waters shall be sure. And we are told that um, um, at the end, that uh, we shall see that our choices in this present life have been of great consequences in the end. My final plea is this. My final plea is this. Although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be in the vines. The labor of the olive shall fail and the field shall yield no meat. The flock shall be cut off from off the field and there shall be no more hard in the stalls. Yet I'll rejoice in the Lord. I'll joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength and he will make my feet like his feet and he will make me to walk upon my high places to the chief singer and the, on, the, on my stringed instrument. And so today, things may seem like uh, there is no fruits on the vine, nor there is no or uh, 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 there is no figs on the fig tree and the labor of all of us is failing. But I can tell us one thing. Let us accept the Lord. Let us rejoice in him. Even though the present seems like unto the devil is taking over and he is succeeding in everything. A Christian is a person who does not move by sight, but a Christian is a person who moves by faith. Christ says, in this world, you shall have a lot of tribulations, but be of good cheer because I have overcome the world. And that is why we are being told in Habakkuk 3.18, yet I'll rejoice in the Lord, I'll join in the God of my salvation, although the fig tree shall not blossom, although there shall be no fruit on the vines, and although it seems that all the labor of me fail, yet rejoice in the Lord. The adherents of the truth are now called upon to choose between disregarding a plain requirement of God's word or forfeiting their liberty. If we yield the word of God and accept human custom and traditions, we may still be permitted to live among men to buy and sell and have our rights respected. But in the end, what shall these things profit us? Moses, when uh, he was uh, of age, said, decided that I'll not enjoy the sins of Egypt and being a king there for a season and forfeit my life. Today we can choose. Instead of enjoying sin for a little while, we may go all through the way with God. And although it seems not as, uh, uh, as promising as, as it seems in the eyes, we can still say today, by faith, we believe that everything shall be well. And so, as we live today, let us know that we are making decisions. And we are either arraying ourselves to be on the army against God or on the army on the Lord's side. And so, may the Lord bless us as we make uh, these decisions today. And shall we close with the word of prayer? Heavenly Father, thank you that uh, in this uh, warfare, it is only the spirit that can lead us to make the right decision. Without you, we can do nothing. And so today we pray for the abundance of the oil in our lamps, even that extra oil that can go through the time of trouble as has never been. Thank you for the blessings you give unto us. And we pray that uh, we may not only selfishly uh, accord these blessings to us only, but share with them with others. And so, May your hand be upon us as we continue doing your work in thy vineyard. In the precious name of thy son, we ask these things. Amen.